morning, everybody. Let's get a blue songbook, and we'll turn to number 354. Let's stand and sing number 354. What a friend we have in Jesus. so chaotic out there mm. it's a mess and it's not going to get any better and by the way it always has been a mess yeah. Yeah. just because tucker carlson figured it out you know in the last <laughs> couple months that it's a mess doesn't mean it wasn't before yeah. he came to the limelight or whoever was before him uh and i'm sort of thankful that uh we got somebody we can take our troubles to let's pray and then we'll sing a couple more lord i thank you for being able to gather here this morning Lord, I thank you for the comfort that you give us. Uh, Lord, we all, uh, most of us here have many, many friends. We can take some of our troubles too. Um, even husbands and wives uh, can help with troubles, Lord, but there's nobody that we can take all of them to except you. And I thank you for being able to do that. I ask that you'd help us to not be too proud to do that when troubles come. And Lord, I ask that you'd help us to uh, take and um, enjoy the comfort and the peace that you give us when we take the things to you and leave them at your feet and let you handle them and uh, let you deal in our life uh, the way that you see fit. Lord, I ask you please bless this morning, the fellowship here, Lord. I thank you for the sweet fellowship, the place to meet, um, sweet spirit in here this morning. Lord, I ask that you please help us to hear from you today. Help us to be willing, help us to be able to hear from you, uh, get any unconfessed sin out of our hearts. And uh, Lord, I ask you to get any unclean spirits out of here that uh, would hinder your gospel and your message and the preaching and the things on the on the, what, what you want to have said today, Lord, that they'd be able to be said freely. I ask you to bless the singing, the giving, everything done here will glorify you. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, how about number 38? Number 38. <clears throat> joyful, joyful. <laughs>
again, so it's becoming more familiar. All right, sing it out on the second verse. Oh, tell of his might, oh, sing of his grace. Picture this song being sung in heaven. See if you can do that. See if that, that, that fits your understanding of heaven. All right? On the first verse. All hail the. Oh, I had the wrong song. All right. Let's try that again. That's not what I was singing. I was singing oh, 04,000 times. Well, we got All Hail the Power. Everybody else had it. Go ahead. start with the really good news. Potluck is on the 7th <laughs> next month. Uh, and uh, we have new move packets. And uh, last month it was about 100. And this month it's about 250. So if you can help, it would really be appreciated. See me after, after service and I'll get you set up. Um, June 20th through the 23rd, which is uh, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, we've got David Spurgeon 
going to be uh, coming and speaking with us. And uh, David uh, was the president of a um, competitor to the Hell's Angels. So he's got quite a, quite a testimony about uh, how God turned his life around. And uh, youth camp uh, is coming up, and it's mid-July. Mid-July, and uh, they're going to need to start planning. Um, so let Beth know as soon as you know if you can make it. And if you have any questions, you can, she can answer those. Is there anything I missed? No? Pastor? Well, I don't know how you guys pay attention to the preaching with this guy's doing sign language over there. He was a competitor <laughs> to the Bell Angels biker gang. He was in the Outlaws biker gang back in the 80s. And uh, so I'm looking forward to having him here preach. How many of you have heard David Spurgeon preach before? A couple of you. Okay. Yeah. He's uh, he's he won't have any trouble holding your attention. As you say. <laughs> All right, so that'll be a little different for us. Uh, we haven't done a Sunday through Wednesday meeting, so we'll try that, see how it goes. I don't think there's any convenient time to have a meeting. It's just going to have to be you take some time off. You have to make a little sacrifice here and there, and uh, we'll have regular time six o'clock in the evening. And uh, if you guys want to do something else during the week, we'll have to figure that out uh, when we get closer to that. But uh, that's in June, so I'll try to re or remind Kurt to announce that from time to time and uh, more as we get closer to that. All right. We sang enough songs, I think. Let's get a Bible through to Genesis <laughs> chapter 42. Genesis chapter 42. <coughs> we have been traveling through the book of Genesis for a number of weeks now, and my wife could tell you that I love a good challenge, and if I don't have a challenge, I'll get bored and I'll find a challenge. Um, and this preaching has been a good challenge. Um, I've never, I've never preached through a book. I've taught through many books in the Bible, but this is the first time. This is the first time that I have preached through a book, and uh, and so to teach and give you the story, and then also give you some preaching. How many of you do know the difference between preaching and teaching? Okay, I was surprised to learn that some people don't know the difference. I thought it was obvious. Um, teaching is what you got in elementary school. The teacher gives you facts. You apply the facts to your brain. You fill your head with a bunch of knowledge. Then you got to get the bigger hat every year you go to school because you're so smart. <laughs> and, and then preaching is we already have the facts. Maybe, maybe lay some groundwork. This is what the facts are. We already have some knowledge. We already know what the text says. What are you going to do about it? That's preaching. You know, some of the greatest preachers in history were not even Christians. And the greatest preachers were men like Martin Luther King, who could stir people around a cause, an unbiblical cause, an unrighteous cause. Isaac, you're against Martin? I'm against everybody. You should know that. <laughs> Anybody ever heard Hitler preach? I don't know, a bit of German, but I've looked up just a clip of him here and there, and he could rally a crowd, thousands and thousands of people. He was one of the greatest preachers of the last century. Not a Christian, not for a good cause, but to preach means what are you going to do about it? <laughs> so to take the text and to learn something and to get the facts and to apply it at the same time is quite a challenge. I want to preach this morning out of Genesis 42. We're going to skim through these chapters. We cannot read all the verses for time or you'll be here for, for days uh, expounding all this. You can't focus on everything. There's Jacob in the story. We've been looking at the life of Joseph. Of course, Joseph was lied about by his brethren. His brethren sold him into slavery, and then they tell Jacob, his father, that he's probably dead. They let him come to that own conclusion, and they essentially lied to him. And Joseph goes into Egypt. We talked about Joseph's prosperity. He went through a very great trial in life, and he had to trust God's words that God gave him when he was just a little boy. And he, all he had was those dreams that God gave him when he was a little kid. And God told him something's going to happen, and Joseph held on to that in Potiphar's house, getting kicked into prison, and getting death left and forgotten in prison for two years, even after the guy said, oh yeah, I'll tell Pharaoh, I'll just put in a good word for you. And two years goes by before he hears anything else. And we come through the life of Joseph, and I want to turn our focus to the life of the, of the uh, 11 brethren. And specifically the 10 brethren, I suppose, because Benjamin's kind of a, a key point in here. Uh, if you remember, Joseph and Benjamin were full brothers. 
So Joseph's mother was Rachel, and Benjamin's mother was Rachel, and Rachel died when she was giving birth to Benjamin. So Jacob really loved Rachel, and because of that, he showed favoritism toward Joseph, and that worked against him and his brethren. Now, do you think that Joseph, um, the favoritism that Jacob showed Joseph, do you think that that favoritism was also shown to Benjamin? Yes. Now that Joseph's gone, probably tenfold more. And Benjamin doesn't turn out to be one of the greatest tribes when you look down at uh, the rest of his history. Uh, that favoritism is a double-edged sword. In Joseph's case, it worked out really well in the end. Joseph was shown favoritism by his father, and he's the one that turned out right. Well, Benjamin gets shown some favoritism by his father, undoubtedly. I'm, I'm guessing that. But then for sure by Joseph, and we'll see that later. And then Benjamin is one of the most wicked tribes that ever shows up in the, in the uh, history of the Old Testament. I'm not going to go into Benjamin today. That favoritism can work both ways. You know what the difference is? Two boys had a drunk father. One of them said, you know, I will never be a drunk. Why? Because my dad's a drunk. Another boy said, I'm going to be a drunk. Why? Because my dad's a drunk. What are you going to do? There's a difference in your heart, and the heart is what makes a difference in your life. And so the only thing that you can do is you can change your heart to, to respond properly to the circumstances that God puts you in. Let's read Genesis 42. We'll just read three verses to get started. Genesis 42 and verse 1. It says, Now when Jacob saw that there was corn in Egypt, Jacob said unto his sons, Why do you look one upon another? You can imagine the conversations that take place in their family, just like your family. What are you staring at each other for? Let's do something. Verse 2, And he said, Behold, I have heard that there is corn in Egypt. Get you down thither, and buy for us from thence, that we may live and not die. And Joseph's ten brethren went down to buy corn into Egypt. Um, you might not see it offhand here, but the topic of the message here I want to get into, focusing on Joseph's brethren, is the process of... Of humbling a process of humbling Lord I thank you for your words again I don't just say that uh, as a preacher Lord I say that because I'm very thankful that we have this book Lord, we've taken advantage of it and let it set aside many times many days in our life where we didn't even appreciate it and appreciate the value that it has and the light that it gives and Lord I ask you to forgive us for that I ask you to help us this morning as we look at these pages to see that it's more than just a story it's more than just an amazing um, uh, list of events that happened that, that uh, you had compiled. But Lord, there's some um, lessons to be learned in here from any person that we focus on. I ask you to help us stay focused on this one group this morning. And that we'd see the process of humbling and what you're looking for in men's lives even today. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, before you even know what humble is or what humble means, I want to tell you the secret to humility. So we have kind of an idea what humility is, but I'll define it in a minute. Let me just start off by giving the, the secret of humility. So if you want to start turning to James, I'm going to read you another passage in 1 Peter. I'm going to turn to James too if I can find it and talk at the same time. Hold your place in Genesis. We're, we're just going to lay a foundation here on humility. In 1 Peter chapter 5, while you're turning to James, it says, Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you. All of you, no exceptions, all of you, be subject one to another. Well, I want to be in charge of people. Be subject one to another. Well, I'm the preacher of this church. Be subject one to another. It goes for everybody. And be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Now, verse Peter 5, verse 6 says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Look at James chapter 4. James chapter 4. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, as said in the book of 1 Peter chapter 5. Look at James chapter 4. James chapter 4 and verse 6. It says, But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. James and Peter are in agreement on this. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be afflicted, and mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, and your joy to heaviness. Verse 10, here's the secret of humility. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Here's the great secret to humility. 
I don't think I need to preach a whole message on this and save it till the end. The secret of humility is that you can humble yourself. Do not make God humble you. We're going to look at the humbling process and how God will humble a man if he makes him take that direction. But the secret of humility, if you want three things, I boiled it down to three things here. Number one, God hates pride. We know that. That's very clear in Scripture. We're not going to run all those references today. Number two, you can humble yourself. And number three, God will humble you if you don't. You know, the problem with pride is that sometimes you don't see it in yourself. Remember Nebuchadnezzar back there in Daniel's day? And Nebuchadnezzar was looking over his kingdom. Look at this great kingdom I came up with. Boy, look at this thing I put together. No, buddy, you just kind of showed up on the scene and worked a plan that, that came out good. And God blessed you and had a man came, named Daniel come into your life. And he changed some things too. And God's doing a work in the nation of Israel's lives. And Nebuchadnezzar, you just have a sideline part of it. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, after he was humbled, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, all whose works are truth and his ways judgment. And those, this is Nebuchadnezzar's conclusion, those that walk in pride, he is able to abase. Did Nebuchadnezzar see his own pride? No. He said, look at this great kingdom that I have created. And then after he was humbled, then he looked back and he saw in his own heart, he saw, wow, I was full of pride and I didn't even know it. That's the, that's the irony of pride. Sometimes you don't even see it in yourself. It's easy to spot sins in other people, but when it's in yourself, then it's, ugh. I don't know if I've ever preached an entire message on pride. This is on humility, same thing. Um, I remember in, sitting in church, I was younger. I think, I think I was married at the time. I don't remember. I just remember the preacher preaching on pride, and then the next week he preached on pride again. Not the whole sermon. And then the next week he preached on pride. And I thought, you know, I am tired of hearing these messages on pride. I'm just going to go forward to the altar and I'm going to pray. And if I got any pride in me, I don't want any pride there. I don't think I have any pride, but I'll, I'll just go forward. <laughs> so so I, go, I go up to the altar. I'm like, Lord, if there's any pride in me. And, and it, was like, it was like something was lifted off of me that I didn't even know was there. Oh, maybe I did have a little bit of pride in me. Maybe the preacher was preaching at me. And maybe he stopped preaching on it after I finally got right with the Lord. I don't know. It's hard to recognize it in yourself. You say, who, who, are you, who do you think is full of pride here? All of you and nobody, right? I, I don't know. I'm not preaching this to somebody. I don't know uh, why you chose to come to church today. I hope you came for the right reason, right? Uh, I hope that, you, that you're here today uh, with an open heart to hear what God has for you. But... Um, but if there's, if there's pride, I know this. I know God hates it. I know you can address it yourself. And I know God will eventually address it if you don't. That's the secret of humility. Now, what is humility? Number one, humility is the opposite of pride. And that doesn't tell us a whole lot. What else is humility? Humility is not self-deprecation. So that's a big word, but it's really the best word for it. Deprecation means disapproval of something. So, so humility is not, I disapprove of myself. I'm no good. I'm a dirt bag. God can't even use me. I'm just lower than whale poop at the bottom of the ocean. That's not humility, right? Humility is somewhere in between not proud and self, you know, talking about against yourself. You know, the problem with self-deprecation is that it's still all about self. It's still all about you. So what is humility? Humility has an element of lowliness, has an element of little preoccupation with self. And that's not a full definition, but that's what humility entails. You could simplify it even more, although this doesn't cover everything. Humility is thinking about others instead of yourself. In the feudal system in England, remember the serfs and the knights and all the things you learn in school? I don't know why we learned that, but that has to do with anything today. But uh, they used to have these leftover cuts of meat. And so the upper class would do their shopping. They'd come to the market. They'd buy the best cuts of meat. And then all the chopped off end pieces and the, the, the lesser desirable pieces of meat were called the umbles, U-M-B-L-E-S. And they suspect that our word humble can trace its roots back to that all the way to the phrase, he needs to eat some humble pie. That's where that supposedly comes from. Mahatma Gandhi said this, a humble person is not conscious of his humility. 
I hope all the red flags went up in your mind like they do when I read Mahatma Gandhi's quotes. <laughs> Isaac's quote Mahatma Gandhi. A humble person is not conscious of his humility. Isn't that what we kind of think? I don't agree with this quote. Isn't that what we kind of think, though? You know, we kind of think, you know, who's the most humble person in this room? Oh, we can't raise our hands, right? That's the <laughs> joke, right? Don't raise your hand if you're the humblest person here. But I found a verse in Acts. I mean, nothing like a Bible to clear up Mahatma Gandhi's nonsense. Acts chapter 20, verse 18 and 19. And when you were come to him, he said unto them, You know, from the first day I came into Asia, Paul speaking here, after what manner I had been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind. Paul says, I know what humility is. I am able to be humble because I'm instructed to humble myself in Scripture. And I was humble when I was in this place serving in humility, serving you in the church. You say, well, it's a sin to know what you're, if you're humble. If you, if you know you're humble, then you're no longer humble. That's Mahatma Gandhi and maybe Jack Hiles. But that's, that's, I, don't think, I don't think that's scriptural. Somebody else said this. Nobody can quote uh, get who, for sure who said it. But humility is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. I think that's far closer to the truth. Putting yourself in the back seat, putting yourself at, at, at uh, just the lowest position, and then letting the Lord do something in your life. Humbleness in, in James here is submission to God. Humbleness in Philippians 2 is Jesus Christ being obedient to the Father. Humbleness entails a lot of different things. Humbleness is recognizing other people's virtues and talents even when they surpass your own. Humbleness is recognizing the limits of your own abilities, talents, and strengths. What is humbleness? A man knowing himself as he truly is abases himself. Did you believe that? That came from a Catholic. Catholic. I give more credit to a Catholic than Mahatma Gandhi. <laughs> At least they find acorns every once in a while. Uh, <laughs> I like this one. Um, Mike Tyson even has it pretty well figured out. He said this to a reporter about when he, he lost all his fortune. He's still famous, but he lost all his fortune. And the reporter said, what happened? Mike Tyson said this, if you're not humble, life will visit humbleness upon you. <laughs> Brother Adrian Rogers said, humility is knowing what I am, acknowledging that God made me that way, and giving him glory for it. Humility isn't this false sense of I'm no good, oh, I'm just nobody. I went to school with those kind of guys, and those kind of guys struggled type of people who are like, I'm just nothing, I'm just a dirt bag and and that's a that's not a healthy attitude. All flesh is grass, right? We're made of the dust, we go back to dust. But you are a tool that God fashioned for a specific purpose, a tool that has life, that has his spirit inside of you. I have some tools and I will be readily I will call them junk on a moment's notice. This is a piece of junk to why do you keep it around. Well, it's not a very good screwdriver, but sometimes it makes a good chisel. That's why I keep it around. <laughs> but you know what? I don't think all my tools are junk. They're inanimate objects, but some of them do a very um, specific job, and they're very valuable when you're underneath the sink and your back's twisted in those ways that only your chiropractor knows un and understands, and you're in between two pipes, <laughs> and you're trying to get... And that one tool is the only tool that fits in that spot where you cannot reach any other way. Otherwise, 364 days out of the year, it sits in a bag. You say, oh, I'm nothing, I'm worthless, I'm just, I'm just a, a pile of junk and God can't even use me. No, God can use you for the specific purpose that he created you to be used for if you will be available to him to be used. We might never get to the message today. <laughs> Proverbs says, the fear of the Lord is instruction of wisdom and before honor is humility. He says it again, Proverbs 18, before destruction, the heart of man is haughty. That means proud. And before honor is humility. Proverbs 22, by humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor. By humility are riches and honor in life. The humility comes first and then the honor follows. Do you know what the purpose of humility is? I'm giving all the secrets to my message away right at the beginning. You know, zone out on the message. I've given you all the best stuff first. <laughs> a man's pride shall bring him low, but honor shall uphold the humble in spirit. 
the humility comes first because God wants to honor you later. I was thinking about this message. At the, turn back to Genesis at the beginning of the week. I thought, what is in here? What is in here? I've heard other preachers preach other things. I like to preach my own messages. I've maybe preached two or three other preachers' sermons in my life. And I got this set of skis at my house that I bought last year, and then all the snow melted by the time they shipped them to me. So I've just been staring at them in the corner. My wife's been telling me to get them out of the house, and I've been telling her I'm not getting them out of the house. They're staying right there in that corner because I want to look at them, and I want to be reminded of what I didn't get to do yet. So I got these skis out, and I've never skied before in my life. So I go out to the park, and I just wanted to go ski in some circles, and I got boring real quick. I found these, these hills out there at this park over, it's called Almond Park, if you know where that is. And so I go up there, and I scooch up to the top of this hill, and then I go down this hill, and I slide sideways, and I go up on my heels, and down I go, and I tumble, and a ski goes flying, and I thought, that was humiliating. <laughs> and I look around, and there's nobody here, and I grab my ski, and I stand up, and what's even more humiliating, I can see over the hill that I just fell off of. <laughs> That's how big of a hill this was. So I scooched up there and did it again. I scooched up there and did it again. Then these people came out with sleds and wanted to start sledding, and I was just too embarrassed. I had to leave. So, <laughs> so I was going to drive home, and I thought, you know, there's another park that's got some bigger hills. Maybe I'll go try some bigger hills. Because <laughs> the problem is once you get going, you get your balance, then it changes at the bottom, and I just didn't have time to get my balance. So I go to this other hill, and there's lots of people sledding at this park over on 5th and whatever that is, Pioneer Park. So I scooch over there and I kind of find a spot and I didn't have to find a spot very long because once they saw me go down, the sledge just got further and further and <laughs> further away. And I, <laughs> I barely, barely, barely made it down that hill and had a really long runway at the end so I didn't have to worry about stopping. I still haven't figured out how to stop. <laughs> but I did that hill, I don't know, two or three or four or five times, just up and down, up and down this hill. And every time I came up, kind of glancing out my sunglasses at everybody around me, like, this is so humiliating. <laughs> and then the thought occurred to me, everybody who has ever skied ever in their entire life was at the position I am at today. Don't know how to stop, can't keep their balance, don't know how to slide down a hill without running into other people. I went out to the real ski place the other day, and I got all done on the little rubber sidewalk. They call it the magic carpet. It's not very magical. <laughs> so the rubber sidewalk takes you up, and I ski down. I went down twice, and I was trying to salmon, you know, like the salmon thing, and I just salmoned every time I hit the snow fence, and then I got started again, and hit the rubber sidewalk, and I could, then an instructor showed me how to stop, so I didn't kill anybody. <laughs> But at the end, I said, I still don't know how to stop. At the end, the, the, the little kitty area is nice and flat and smooth, but then it drops off down to the lodge. I'm like, how am I going to get down there? I'm not taking my boots off. That was way too much work. So I'm, I'm just going to try to stop because she showed me how to stop. I almost ran into somebody else. Sorry. Sorry, new guy. Sorry. Can't stop. They never turned around. I missed them by an inch, and then I, I made it back to my truck without anybody dying. You know the guy you watch in the Olympics? He started there. Sorry, run away. Watch out below. He started there on day one. Maybe he was only three or four or five years old and he got the humility out of the way early on in life. Isn't that the way to go? Humble yourself early before it has to be this big, before you're 40 years old and learn these lessons, right? Isn't that a little easier? What happens when you don't humble yourself? Number one, a foe arises. A foe rises. In chapter 41 and verse 57, it says, All the countries came into Egypt to Joseph for to buy corn, because that the famine was so sore in the land. You know what God will do in a man's life when he's not humble? He'll bring him to a place where he's out of control and can do nothing to regain the control of his life. What are you going to do to stop a famine? Nothing. Nothing. Who caused the famine? God caused the famine. Who did the famine affect? The famine affected everybody. But you and your pride affects you differently than affects other people. Joseph wasn't affected by the famine like the brethren were affected by the famine. You know what happens? A foe rises. It's just a natural thing. It's just a natural thing for you to respond to the famine and say, What are we going to do? What are we going to do? Why are you guys sitting around looking at each other? What are we going to do? Let's go find some bread. Did they pray about it? Didn't they know Abraham, Isaac had these problems too and famines? And God said, don't go down there. Why'd you go down there, Abraham? You messed up a bunch of things in your life because didn't they remember their history? No, they just said, there's a problem. We're going to fix it. 
and the problem cannot be fixed in their control. Number two, what happens when uh, God wants to humble a man? He, they are forced into reliance. Look at chapter 42 again, in verse 6. 42 and verse 6. Joseph was the governor over the land, and he it was that sold to all the people of the land. And Joseph's brethren came and bowed down themselves before him with their faces to the earth. There's a lot of things going on here. This is the partial fulfillment of the dream. There's 10 out of 11 sheaves bowing down here. 10 out of 11 stars. The 11th will show up later. And Joseph says, oh, oh my. <laughs> We're not looking at Joseph's life. I'd like to preach on Joseph. But there's a reliance on Joseph. I told you last time, Joseph is a picture of Jesus Christ in a number of ways throughout his life. What happens when the foe rises? God will force you in your state of pride into a position of reliance on somebody greater than you. And what he's pushing you towards is a reliance on him. He'll back you into a corner, so to speak, to where you have nowhere else to go except to him. You know why I like these songbooks, especially the paperback songbooks? There's some good ones in the blue one, but these talk about heaven. These talk a lot more about burdens. These talk a lot more about dying. These talk about getting to the promised land. You know why? Because we don't have it all figured out down here, and I'm looking for something better. You see, Isaac, you're just a pie in the sky. Just want to get to heaven because you want to avoid the troubles. You got me. Guilty. <laughs> Guilty as charged. I know. I'm supposed to be super spiritual and say, I want to go to heaven because I want to see Jesus first. I know I'm supposed to say that. I do want to see my Savior, and I am looking forward to Him. But you know what I see every day? I'm not a super spiritual Christian. I'm, I'm just like anybody else. I don't want to deal with problems. And God puts problems in your life because you won't turn to Him sometimes. You won't turn to Him without the problems. You're forced into reliance. These brethren, they're full of their own pride, their own ideas. And then they have to deal with a rough situation. Look at verse 7. Joseph saw his brethren and he knew them, but made himself strange unto them, and spake roughly unto them. A rough situation shows up. Why is he so harsh? Why has Joseph got to turn into such a jerk to these brethren? He's being used of the Lord. And Joseph has something in mind here. And the Lord has something in mind. Verse 11. We are all one man's sons. We are true men. Oh. Oh, there's the problem. <laughs> Joseph's gained some wisdom in the last 21 or 22 years. Remember he was 13? Remember he was 30 when he came to the palace? There's been seven years of famine. That's 20. This is at least a year into the famine. Enough time for people to have run out of food. 21, 22 years have passed. Joseph is 38 or 39 years old. And he has gained a little wisdom in life to see through the deception of those brethren that he's thought about so many times over the years. And when those words come out of their mouth, we are true men. Joseph says, nay. Verse 12. You're not. Of course, he accuses them of, of being spies and all that. But you know what men do? Men like to justify themselves. Most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness. But a what? Faithful man. Faithful man who can find. I, brother, you got to apologize. I'm not talking to you. I was going to say this whether we had visitors or not. Okay? So this isn't, this isn't toward you now that I call all the attention to you. This is not <laughs> have anything to do with you. And he didn't say this either. This is what happens, though. Visitors come to church, and they come, they shake my hand afterwards, and they, they say, Brother, that was a great message. I'm like, it's a great message because you've never heard any of my illustrations before, and you haven't heard me repeat myself like my kids. I mean, that's why I thought it was great. It was a great man. We love this church. This church is for us. We are going to be members of this church. Every man will proclaim everyone his own goodness. But a faithful man who can find... Brother... I appreciate that. I always smile. I thank them. I mean, maybe they mean it from their heart, and I cannot judge their heart. But 99 times out of 100, I don't see that person again. Because a faithful man, who can find? We are true men. We needed that message today. That was great. Well, well just, just sit back. Just take it one Sunday at a time. Just two or three times. And then you get to know all my quirks and oddities. And then if you can deal with all that, <laughs> then get committed. And just keep it between you and the Lord. How's that? We are true men. No, you're justifying yourself. 
Look at verse 12. He said unto them, Nay, but ye came to see the nakedness of the land. They said, Thy servants are twelve brethren, the sons of one man in the land of Canaan. And behold, the youngest is this day with our father, and one is not. That's Joseph who's dead. And Joseph said unto them, This is it that I spake unto you, saying, Ye are spies. Hereby ye shall be proved. By the life of Pharaoh ye shall not go forth hence, except your younger brother come hither. Joseph says, You're guilty. And if you wanted to admit your guilt at this point, you could exit the process of humility. You know, at every place along this process, there's an exit ramp where you can say, I'm guilty. We are not spies, Joseph, but we are guilty. We're lying to you. The one that is not, we just don't know where he is. And they don't choose that route. It's so, oh, so simple. I've had a number of military preachers in my life that I've listened to. They went into the military. I've never been in the military. But I picked up a couple little things along the way that they would say. One of them was this. There's only three things you need to know in the military, right? There's only a thousand things. But they always like to say there's only one thing or three things, you know. It's laying down, pick it up. If you can't pick it up, paint it. And if it's something else, whatever. But this is the one thing for, for this quote. In the military, they teach you get down, stay down. And what? Don't get up. Don't get up. <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, in the process of humility, you can exit the process anytime you want by pretty much doing nothing. How much work does it take to get down? None. Stop working and you'll fall to the ground. How much work does it take to stay down? None. How much work does it take to not get up? None. <laughs> so how do I exit the process of humility? Get down and say, I'm guilty. And don't get back up and make a make a uh, exalt yourself. Well, the process continues for these brethren, and fear results. Look at verse twenty-one. Fear results. And they said one to another, "This is them speaking to themselves in Hebrew." Of course, they don't think Joseph can understand them. They said one to another, "We are very guilty." <laughs> Who do they admit this to? The wrong people. Of course, they all know they're guilty. They're the only ones that know the secret. They said one to another, We are very guilty concerning our brother, in that we saw the anguish of his soul when he besought us. It all comes flooding back. And we would not hear, therefore is this distress come upon us. And Reuben answered them, saying, Spake I not unto you, saying, Do not sin against the child, and ye would not hear. Therefore, behold, also his blood is required. You know, this is the first time Joseph hears those details of his brethren conspiring against him. And later on, he's going to put Simeon in prison. It should have been Reuben. Reuben's the firstborn representing the, the younger brethren. He doesn't put Reuben in prison because he hears what Reuben says there and thinks there might be a little bit of repentance in his life. And he hears the details of the story in confidence. So he takes Simeon, the cruel one, the one who went after the other tribe and used a religious act to take advantage of another people. And he puts Simeon, the second born, in prison instead. You know, the simplest answer to humbling at this point is to confess. Just to confess your sins. You say, well, what, who would you confess your sins to? They just said, we are guilty. Yeah, Judas said, I'm guilty. He said, I've betrayed the innocent blood. And he went out and hanged himself. And he died and went to hell. His own place. We can study that another time. Judas repented. But he repented to the wrong person. These people here, these brethren repented. But they didn't repent to God. And they didn't repent to Jacob. In order for true repentance and true humbling to take place, it would have to be involving the people that had offended. You say, Isaac, why are you preaching this stuff? Because over and over and over in my life, yeah, probably that many times, five times or more, I have done something absolutely stupid and said something absolutely asinine. That's an animal. Please don't get offended at my language. <laughs> and the Lord says, I know you want to pray those prayer requests that you have today, but what about so-and-so? And I say, oh, yeah. Yeah, I shouldn't have said that. I wish I hadn't said that. Anyways, back to what I was praying. Next day, you get your prayer requests up. Lord, I need some help with this. And if you got any other sins I forgot to confess, would you remind me? I, ha I have one for you. Actually, just a matter of fact, it's crazy you would ask. So and so. And you say, oh, not that. 
Sometimes I handle it in a week, and sometimes I've waited months. And it's a humbling process that I can exit any time I choose. And that's where the pride's involved, any time I choose. You know how simple it is? I had to pick up the phone one morning on a Sunday morning and call somebody who's an old coworker, hadn't talked to him in, in months, went to their voicemail. I was so thankful they didn't answer because I was so dreading this conversation. And it was nothing. It was nothing to them. I apologized for something I said. They said, yeah, there was this stuff going on too you didn't know about. It was over. It was over in a 30-second voicemail left message on somebody else's phone. And we, and we talked later and had a good friendship after. You know, the humbling process will not be completed here because they have not confessed to the right people. You can confess it to God, but some sins need to confess to the people that you've offended. If it involves them. If it doesn't involve them, just confess it to the Lord. You know, uh, number four in the process, the Father is responsible. God the Father is responsible. Look at verse 28. Uh, If you're not familiar with the story... Joseph takes their money and puts it back in their bags. So they go, they've had these empty bags. They're like, we're going to buy grain. And then they fill them up. And then Joseph takes their money that they paid in, puts it back in the, in the bags, in the feed sacks that they brought. And then they find this, this money here and they get worried again. Verse 28, he said unto his brethren, my money is restored and lo, it is even in my sack. And their heart failed them. They were afraid, saying one to another, what is this that who hath done? You know, God the Father is ultimately responsible. You can blame your problems on bad luck. You can say, I've just got a curse. You can just say, everything I touch is turned into mud. You can say, it's somebody else's fault. But ultimately, one day, it's going to hit you. God is responsible for all these things falling apart in my life. And I'm just going to have to give him credit for it because there's no other way around it. But in man's heart, he has this strange desire to stay deceived. Men have this desire to say, oh, that's not really the way it is. I want to see it in this other lens, this other perspective, this other light that I've crafted around it, instead of facing the truth of reality. And the truth of reality is, this is how it is because this is how it is. Eventually, they have to face their reality. Chapter 43, and verse 1 The famine was so sore in the land it came to pass when they had eaten up the corn which they had brought out of Egypt, their father said to them, Go again, buy us a little food. And Judah spake unto him, saying, The man did solemnly protest unto us, saying, Ye shall not see my face except your brother be with you. If thou wilt send our brother with us, we will go down and buy thee food. But if thou wilt not send him, we will not go down. You know what you have to do? You have to face up to reality. You know what reality says? There's 13,800 volts on those power lines out there. You know what reality says? If you touch those, you will die. That's just one little fact of reality. I hope that helps you today. You can watch some OSHA videos on your own time on that. There's no bloop, 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 bloop. Oh, we get a new life. Bloop. It doesn't work that way, right? In real life, reality says there are consequences for your actions and you will have to deal within the framework of reality. So Isaac, this is nonsense. Why are you saying all this? Well, of course we know that. Some of us know this. <laughs> you know, they did a study one time on people who consider themselves lucky versus people who consider themselves unlucky. How many of you have heard this study? They gave people a daily newspaper, except it was a fake newspaper, and throughout the newspaper were these fake ads. And in the ads, there's there was multiple ads throughout the whole paper. I don't know if there's 10 or 15 or 20. But in these ads, it said, if you are reading this ad, stop immediately. If you hand this paper to the instructor now, you will receive $5 or $10 or whatever it is. And so they, they, questioned, they brought people in for this interview, and they said, do you consider yourself lucky? And the person said, yeah, I'm a pretty lucky person, you know. Okay, go read this newspaper in that room. We're doing an experiment. We'll let you know in the end. Another person coming, do you consider yourself lucky? No, I'm not a very lucky person. I have pretty bad luck. They gave them the newspaper. They did this with hundreds of people. Guess who found the ads in the paper? 
The lucky people found them every time. Not every time, but a high percentage of the time. Why'd they find them? Because this attitude of unluckiness is what they call a learned helplessness. When a person believes that the chance is made, that the, sorry, that the choices made in life have no effect on the outcomes in life, then they're taught, I have no control over my circumstances, I'm just an unlucky person. Some people make excuses for their unluckiness. Some people can't keep a job, and the reality is it's because they're tardy, because they steal from the company, they're underperforming what they were hired to do, but they won't see it that way because they're unlucky. So they tell themselves it's some kind of perceived unfairness. Pointing a guy named Vance from Hillbilly Elegy, if you want to read the book. They tell themselves it's some perceived unfairness. Obama shut down the coal mines, or all the jobs went to the Chinese. And they believe these lies that they tell themselves, and it causes a cognitive dissonance. It means in your mind you're trying to believe two things that don't, you can't believe something's black and white at the same time. You cannot believe that. So they believe two dissimilar things at the same time, and they have a broken connection to the world where they live. <laughs> the values they preach. You know what you're going to have to do in this process of humility? You're going to have to deal with the Benjamin problem. <laughs> you're going to have to deal with the little brother that dad wants to protect and it's the only thing he has left and his life is bound up in the lad's life, it says later on. And it's going to deal with Jacob's life, but we're not focused on Jacob today. It's going to deal with Joseph's brethren's dealing with reality. And Joseph has a problem that he wants to figure out. Joseph's trying to figure out, do these brethren still have the same attitude toward my little brother that they had toward me? And he's going to work through this no matter what it takes. He's going to find this out, and it's going to be a win-win for him. He's either going to get Benjamin, right? He's going to get him to come back, and he's going to keep Benjamin and trap him there with him and send the brothers on their way. And if they leave, fine, I'll, I'll give the details to Benjamin, and I have my brother back. And if they repent... And they take the process of humility. They become exalted to the most highest preeminence that they could ever imagine in Egypt. That they could never imagine in Egypt. He wants to find out, do they treat him the same? Does Jacob's favoritism extend to Benjamin and still cause those brothers to be jealous? Are those brothers sorry for their past sins? Say, why is Joseph doing all this? Because Joseph understands the nature of God. <laughs> And Joseph is acting in the place of God so much so that 150 places or more, you could say, he is just like Jesus Christ. <laughs> Cast into a pit, no water, hanging on the cross. Gets uh, betrayed by his brethren, wandering in a field, seeking the lost sheep, and all that. God said in Isaiah 66, But to this man will I look, even to him that is poor, and of a contrite spirit, and trembleth at my words. Contrite means sorrow for sins. You know what God's looking for today? You think God's nature changed any in the last 6,000 years? You know what God's looking for today in this room, today in Billings, Montana? God's looking for somebody who is sorry for their sins. Not sinless. God's looking for a sinner who knows they're a sinner and says, I'm not a very humble person. I would like to be, and I could be humble because the Bible says I can be, but I have to deal with these sins. God, I want to deal with these sins. And God says, Hello, I'm listening. <laughs> so Joseph tests him out. He gives Benjamin five times as much food at the table, puts all the brethren in order, seats him in order. He's watching, he's watching. Gives them their money back again, double money this time, in the sacks of grain. And in Benjamin's sack, he puts his silver cup, sends his servant out after him. Whoever you find the silver cup in, tell him he's going to be taken back and slain. You bring him back to me, and I'm going to deal with these brethren. Look at chapter 43 and verse 17. Mm, 44, verse 17. 44, 17. And he said, God forbid that I should do so, but the man in whose hand the cup is found, he shall be my servant. As for you, get you up in peace unto your father. Just said, you want to go home now? Now's the time to go home. You boys take off. You can leave Benjamin here. And everything will be just fine. And I want to read a couple verses here. I know we're at the end of the message. And usually you read everything at the beginning. But 
We're doing everything a little different today. I want to read a few verses here, starting in verse 18. This is the recap of the whole story, and this is beautiful. This is, this is literature that cannot be produced today. Then Judah came near unto him and said, O my Lord, let thy servants, I pray thee, speak a word in my Lord's ears, and let not thine anger burn against thy servant, for thou art even as Pharaoh. I think some humbling has taken place. My Lord asked his servant, saying, Have ye a father or a brother? And we said unto my Lord, We have a father, an old man, and a child of his old age, a little one, and his brother is dead, and he alone is left of his mother, and his father loveth him. And thou saidst unto thy servants, Bring him down unto me, that I may set mine eyes upon him. And we said unto my Lord, The lad cannot leave his father, for if he should leave his father, his father would die. And thou saidst unto thy servants, Except your youngest brother come down with you, Ye shall see my face no more. And it came to pass when we came up unto thy father, thy servant, thy fa my father, we told him the words of my Lord. And our father said, Go again, buy us a little food. And we said, We cannot go down if our youngest brother be with us. Then we will go down, for we will, may not see the man's face except our youngest brother be with us. And thy servant, my father, said unto us, Ye know that my wife bear me two sons. Imagine Joseph hearing this. And the one went out from me, and I said, Surely he is torn in pieces, and I saw him not since. Ugh. And if you take this also from me, and mischief befall him, ye shall bring down my gray hairs with sorrow to the grave. Now therefore, when I come to thy servant my father, and the lad be not with us, seeing that his life is bound up in the lad's life, it shall come to pass, when he seeth that the lad is not with us, that he will die, and thy servant shall bring down the gray hairs of thy servant our father with sorrow to the grave. For thy servant came, became surety for the lad unto my father, saying, If I bring him not unto thee, then I shall bear the blame to my father forever. Now therefore, I pray thee, let thy servant, Judah says, let me, abide instead of the lad, a bondman to my Lord, and let the lad go up with his brethren. For how shall I go up to my father, and the lad be not with me, lest peradventure I see the evil that shall come on my father? In the process of humility, God will have your true feelings revealed. It's all laid out before God and everybody. And you can sense the humility in Joseph's voice from the first sentence in the last sentence and Judah says I'll take his place and Joseph says there's repentance and you know what it's fixed in Joseph's mind from this point right here it's fixed not only are they forgiven they're accepted no matter what they do later on Jacob's going to die and the brethren are going to come running back and send a messenger to Joseph and they're going to say Joseph did we do something is, is there anything ought that you have against us and Joseph's going to say what are you guys talking about I forgave you a long time before you showed up, and I accepted you the day that you repented. Verse 1, Joseph could not refrain himself. Before all them that stood by him, he cried, Cause every man to go out from me. And there stood no man with him, while Joseph made himself known unto his brethren. And he wept aloud, and the Egyptians in the house of Pharaoh heard, and Joseph said unto his brethren, I am Joseph. I told my wife last night, I was reading through some of this. I said, there are some places in the Bible, I haven't read them a thousand times, but I, hundreds of times I've seen this passage since I was in Sunday school. You read the passage a hundred times and it still speaks to you. You could probably read some of these passages a thousand times. And Joseph, the whole scene, standing there before his brethren, get every man out for me. It's Joseph, 11 brothers, <laughs> and nobody's left. It's like you at the judgment. It's like God and the nation of Israel and all the Egyptians and the Gentiles hear the commotion from outside the rooms of heaven, of the walls of heaven. I am the Messiah. <laughs> One day Jesus Christ is going to say to his people. But here he says, I am Joseph, doth my father yet live? And his brethren are speechless. That's men at the judgment. And they were troubled at his presence. And Joseph said unto his brethren, Come near to me, I pray you. And they what? They came near. Fellowship is restored. You know, the purpose of the humbling process isn't to beat you down and mash you into nothing and leave you there for... That's not the purpose of the humbling. 
purpose of the humbling, I, I know the message is a little down and a little dreary, but the purpose of the humbling, and some of you have been through it, and it's not a dread to hear the sermon when you've been through it in the past. It's, yeah, I have been humbled, and then the Lord worked something out of me and took the rough edges off, and iron sharpeneth iron. Do you know what kind of iron sharpens iron? Grungy old rusty files. You know what I am sometimes behind this pulpit? I'm not a shiny brand new file. Fresh out of Bible school. <laughs> and I'm not a real expensive Japanese something or other file. You know, 70 years old and got everything just refined down to, you know, powerful, earth-shattering sermon. I'm just a rusty, it's probably the one you found in the dirt and it barely grinds off the edges anymore. But you know what iron sharpened iron? And the purpose for the sharpening, the purpose for the grinding and the heat that it creates and the displeasure that it causes is for the thing to be able to be more useful as the tool that it was made to begin with. The fellowship is restored and they came near unto Joseph. I am your brother who was sold into Egypt. You know, at this point, this is the first point where the father, Jacob, can be revived. This is the first place where the family can be completely rejoined. This is the only place where the famine can be forgotten. Joseph's not worried about the famine. I mean, he's got a lot of work to do, but he's not worried about going hungry. This is the only place where the future can be established in righteousness for these brethren. You know, the purpose of the humbling process is for you to be able to glorify God. Thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, only mention of eternity in the Bible, whose name is holy, I dwell, I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit. God says, I dwell in holiness. You can't even understand the glory and the magnitude of it. And I dwell with one other thing. Humble and contrite people. No room, no room for pride. Kicked that guy out many, many years ago. He has no place here anymore. His name's Lucifer. His name's the devil now. I just want humble and people who are sorry for their sins to be around me forever, in eternity. To do what? To revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. You know, the humbling process takes an admission that you need reviving. And the purpose of it is very, very clear in Scripture. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. God wants some humility so that when the rejoicing happens and the glory happens and the exalting happens, he takes the credit for it. Say, I'm going to do it myself. I am a self-made man because I was born in Montana. Who born you in Montana? <clears throat> I was born in Montana. I'll die in Montana. Okay. Well, good for you. I'll take it one step further and make sure I hit everybody. I'm a U.S. citizen and I have my rights. Who made you? born in the USA? Twarn't you. <laughs> Watch out for that pride of pride of nationality. I want to know my heritage. I want to know what I'm like and joke about the quirkinesses of it. I mean, I'm interested in all that because it's me, right? It's myself. I'm interested in that. But I didn't have anything to do with the place that I was put in this world. You know how I become greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Humble yourself like a little kid who's got the innocence and doesn't know any better. Whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased. And he that shall humble himself shall be what? Exalted. God wants to exalt you. Some of what Joel Osteen says is true. <laughs> The mark of a good preacher isn't what he says, it's what he won't say. I tell you this, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified. Remember the Pharisee praying, oh, I'm not like other men, right? And the unjust man over there praying, God, I'm, I'm a wicked sinner. This man went to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalted himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. I gave you three different contexts for that being said. None of those are repetitive from the... The gospel does repeat them, but those aren't the repetitions. There are three different cases where he said that. Deuteronomy 8, I'll close with this verse. Who fed thee in the wilderness with manna, 
which thy fathers knew not, that he might humble thee and that he might prove thee. You know, Joseph was acting like God the Father and like God the Son specifically. You know what the end of that verse says? To do thee good at thy latter end. You know what God wants from you? God loves you. <laughs> and that's the truth. I don't care who says it. I don't care if John Maxwell says it, or Joel Osteen, or Rick Warren, or any of the guys that I love to kick from time to time. C.S. Lewis, I don't care who says it. If it's true, it's true. Now, if they leave out the humbling, and there's an element of pride and self, and what can I, you know, what can I do to achieve this? Well, they left that out, then they left out the message. The message is God has a place for you of exaltation, and those brethren go on to be rulers in the kingdom of Egypt for the rest of their lives, and they have nothing to worry about for their family, for their cattle, for their relationship with Joseph even after he dies. 400 years goes by. 400 years before things start to fall apart. That's a blessing. That's longer than your country has been around. That's how long the blessings of God continue when the humbling process can take place the way God wants it to. Lord, I thank you for your words. Thank you for this book. Thank you for these innocent looking stories. Lord, we read them since we've been in Sunday school. Lord, I ask that you please bless the words were spoken today, especially the words that spoke to individuals' hearts, Lord. If you were speaking to people, I ask you to help them to remember those things, help them to apply those things in their own life, help them to recognize it if they're in the middle of the process or you're working on something or filing off an edge. Lord, I ask you to help us to be willing to stay there in the vice while it gets worked on. And Lord, I ask that you please help us to be a humble people and a contrite people and to be able to be close to you and have fellowship with you and stay near to you. Lord, I ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, let's stand and we'll be dismissed with one or two verses of a song. <coughs> Here we go. Let's try 388. 388. our sin, take care of those things, take care of the pride that's prevalent in my life and in others, Lord, I ask that you might help us to take care of it so that you don't have to, Lord, but if we don't, Lord, I ask that you would do what you need to do in each of our lives, starting with myself, to help us to humble ourselves in your presence. Thank you, Lord, for all that we've heard today. Bless this uh, time as we leave and then come back this afternoon, Lord. Thank you.